Hello, everyone. Welcome to the start of sections 5.1 and 5.2 on the second fundamental theorem of calculus. In this second part of the fundamental theorem of calculus, we learn another relationship between integrals and antiderivatives. So to get started, let's look at our first preliminary example. So in this example, we let f be the function shown in the diagram to the right, and we define a function in kind of an interesting way define a of x as the function that's computing the integral from zero to x of f of t dt. So here, this horizontal axis is also playing the role of t. So you might be thinking this is kind of an odd way to define a function, and it kind of is. It's, it's an, probably new to most of us. But one way we can make sense of this function is that what we've been doing so far in our class is finding or computing integrals or area under curves between two points, say 0 to 2. We find that integral or area under the curve, we get a value, and we move on. But similar to in Calc 1, how we created a whole derivative function from looking at derivatives of points, we might want to consider the function whose values are computing integrals at each point, which is exactly the function that we have here, a of x. But to get a little bit more experience and familiarity with this function, why don't we write out some values of this function to get a better sense of it? And why don't we do that by creating a table, which is how you might have seen functions maybe in a pre-calculus or algebra class. So let's test what a of x computes out to be based on certain x inputs. So let's just use some easy inputs for x. Let's say 0, 1, 2, 3, and 4. And then let's look at what the corresponding a of x output should be. So when x is 0, we're computing a of 0. So that's going to be the number that is the integral from 0 to 0 of f of t dt. So one way to look at that is the area under just a single line, which we've seen before is 0. Now what about when x is 1? Well, a of 1 is equal to the integral from 0 to 1 of f of t dt. So we can look at our graph. Here's 1 when t is 1. So we're looking at the area under our curve from 0 to 1. The height of this rectangle here is 4, and the width is 1. So we get the area is 4 times 1, which is 4. And now let's continue. And I encourage you, if you'd like, just pause the video, work out the rest of these on your own, and then skip forward and compare your answers. All right, so on to a of 2 integral from 0 to 2 f of t dt. So now looking at the area from 0 to 2. So we see that that first rectang rectangle had an area of 4, and we're just tacking on another rectangle of 4. So it would be 4 plus 4, which is just 8. All right, let's finish these last two. a of 3 is equal to the integral from 0 to 3 of f of t. Dt. And we can even write that as we've seen with properties of integrals, the integral from 0 to 2 f of t dt, which we already figured out, plus the integral from 2 to 3 f of t dt. So we know the first part of that area here is going to be 4. So now we just have to compute the area under the curve from 2 to 3. So we have 8 plus we have a triangle here with a height of 4 and a width of 1. So we have 1 half base of 1 height of 4, which becomes 8 plus 4 over 2, which is 8 plus 2, which is 10. All right. And finally, we have a of 4, which is the integral from 0 to 4, f of t dt. So now we have our area of 10. Now we need to add on the area from 3 to 4. Now notice this value, the height of our rectangle is now at negative 4. So the area of this rectangle would be 1 half 
one times negative four, which would be plus negative two. So now we're back at eight. All right, so feel free to pause the video and check your work here. And now that we have this table of values, what I'd like us to do is plot these values of the function on the set of axes that we already have set up here. So let's go ahead and do that. I'll use blue for a of x. So at zero, at x is zero, my a of x function is zero. So I'm gonna plot this point here. At one, x equals one, my a of x function is four. So I'll plot the point one, four. At two, x equals two, my a of x function is eight. So at two, I'll go up to eight. So along this part, it looks pretty linear. Okay. Now when x is three, my output of a of x is 10. So I'm gonna go just up here to 10. And then at four, my a of x function is back to eight. Okay, so we haven't collected values between x is two and three or between three and four. So why don't we compute an x, an output for an x in between those two values? So let's use, so a value between two and three, let's use two and a half. Let's just do that calculation here. So when x equals 2.5, Let's look at a of x. All right, so what we're gonna look at is the area under the curve from zero to two and a half. So what we see is that from zero to two, we had the area of eight. And so now what happens between two and two and a half? Well, we need to compute this area here. So we see this area, we have a square here. It's a height of two and a width of one half. So it's more of a rectangle. So two times a half would just be one. So it has an area of one. Then here we have a triangle that's half of that size. So this would be an area of one half. So in total, the integral from zero to two and a half would be eight plus one and a half, which would be nine and a half or 9.5. So the point then on our a of x function when x is two and a half would be up here at nine and a half. So we see that we have eight and 10. So nine would be halfway and nine and a half would be halfway further. So it would be right about here. So we actually see that our, our function kind of curves slightly. And then similar story on the way down. And you can compute that out, find the a of x value when x is three and a half. You can also see visually what's happening here. We have a little bit less area that we're subtracting and then we're subtracting even more area. Okay, so there is our a of x function drawn out on our graph. It's a turnaround point. So let's make some observations about this graph a of x and its relationship to our original function f of t. So we can first observe that during this entire first part of our graph from zero to two, our function is linear. And what kind of slope does it have? Well, it rises four and goes over one, four, one. So the slope here of this part of the graph is four. Where do we see, or what's the behavior of our f function on that part of the curve? it evaluates to four. A of x has a slope of four, f of x or f of t has a value of four, constant four. And then what about as we get through this curved part of our graph? What is happening with the tangent line at x equals three? If we draw in that tangent line, what's the slope there? It's a slope of zero. What happens to the f function there? It has a value of zero. So where have we seen this type of relationship? The slopes of a of x are represented in the outputs of f. We should recognize this, that f looks like the derivative of a of x. So why don't I write down that observation so we can sit on it and think about it for a moment. I'm gonna erase some work here so that I can make some room. You might want to write on another uh, page or a different 
margin of your work. I'm even gonna use a new color here. Okay, so observation. So it appears that F appears to be the derivative of A of X. So IE, in other words, what does that mean? That means the derivative of A is equal to F of X. Whoa. And even in other words, this appears that A is an antiderivative of F. So pause the video at this point, reread this observation, help it feel really comfortable and concrete, convince yourself that it's true by looking at our work that we've done. Because this observation is in fact the takeaway of the second fundamental theorem of calculus. Again, the second fundamental theorem of calculus tells us another way that we can see a relationship between integrals and antiderivatives. So let's look at it together. So let's fill in this box here. So the second fundamental theorem of calculus says, if F is a continuous function and C is any constant, so we can start our, our integral at any lower starting point here. Didn't have to be zero. In our preliminary example, it was just to keep things simple, but it could be any constant C. Then if you define the function A of X as being the integral of F from that constant C to X. So notice what varies here, where's the variable? The variable is in that upper limit here that upper bound of integration. So there's the X, there's the X. So as we vary how far over we are integrating, we are defining our A function. So this A function is the unique antiderivative of F of X that satisfies A of C equals zero. So meaning kind of the lower bound here gives us or tell the input of the lower bound tells us where the function a is equal to zero. In other words, the derivative of this integral, which is the derivative of a is equal to f of x. All right, great work watching this video, everyone. We're going to come back to this fundamental theorem of calculus, the second one, throughout this chapter as we look at some more examples. So it's going to start feeling more comfortable. We're really going to use it as a tool for how to compute more derivatives of different types of functions. All right, thanks for watching. Keep up the hard work.